All right, welcome everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to the January 13th, 2020 City Council, City Council Workshop. Thank you all for being here. Um, Ms. Rush, would you please call the roll? Mayor Williams. Mayor Pro Tem Miller. Here. Council Member Pfeiffer. Here. Council Member Ford. Here. Council Member Jones. Here. Council Member Marriott. Here. Council Member Simpson. Thank you. And can I get a motion to excuse Mayor Williams and Council Member Simpson? I will go ahead and make the motion. I move to excuse uh, Mayor Williams and Councilmember Simpson from tonight's workshop. Mr. Jones. Thank you, and all votes are cast. Motion carries. They are excused. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, we have a couple of workshops that we need to go with. Mr. Devin, Arvada Citizens Transportation Advisory Committee update on first and last mile project. Yes, uh, Madam Mayor and members of the council, we're very pleased to um, have the Arvada Citizens Transportation Advisory Committee uh, present you an update on this project. And we're going, to, uh, John, are you gonna start? Or Terry, or uh, Terry Binder, the uh, chair? of the Transportation Advisory Committee will lead this presentation off. Thank you, Terry. Good evening. Um, I, I want to um, tell you a little bit, first of all, I want to tell you our new chairman is Jadwiga Brown and Wally Wirt is our vice chair and the other members of the committee, would you please stand up that are here tonight? They're here as moral support for me. Okay. Um, we're the Citizens Transportation Advisory Committee. I'm Terry Binder, the former chair. Um, I'm here uh, with the current, current members. Uh, we're here to present the results of our 2019 project, which is the first and last mile. And we've been waiting for this a long time uh, for the gold line, and we finally got it, or I should say the G line, I call it the gold line. Uh, I wanna give you a brief history of what we've been up to. Uh, let's see, John, oh, okay, all right. Um, in 2010, Transportation Committee audited, audited uh, sidewalks and uh, citywide. So we went out and walked all the sidewalks and all the different districts and found missing sidewalks and sidewalks that needed repair. 2011, Transportation Committee worked with the Arvada Bicycle Advisory Committee to audit bike lanes in the Gold Line station areas. 2013-14, uh, Transportation Committee provided input into the 2014 comp plan update and multimodal policies and goals. In 2015, the Transportation Committee worked on the RTD bus service plan and participated in the Citizen CIP Committee. In 2016, the Transportation Committee provided input into the bike master plan. In 2010 through 18, uh, we completed many of the sidewalk gaps the city did. Uh, as per what we found in the audit. And uh, we uh, recommended uh, roadway widening and capacity projects uh, during 2018. And uh, we also helped with the bond initiative last year and uh, the grant with grant applications. And we have Ralston Road and 72nd Avenue in progress. In 2019, since the goal line finally happened, uh, we decided that we should, and we would vote every year on what we felt like we needed to uh, address. And the committee focused on first and last mile, uh, connectivity to transit. So first and last mile, what does it mean? Let's talk about scale. The graphic that you're looking at right now is uh, from the land use section of the comp plan. The land uses that are uh, considered TOD, transit-oriented development, are within one half mile distance to the stations. They're within the dashed red circle. Our project is called First Last Mile and includes the dashed and red circle, but also includes suburban residential neighborhoods surrounding the TODs. A one half mile area is a 10 minute walk and a five minute bike ride if you were going to walk or, or uh, ride a bike to the station. 
but it excludes buses on major corridors and some of the trails and bikeways in many of the destinations that aren't far away. A one mile area is a 20 minute walk and a 10 minute bike ride. By developing one mile focus, we can look at more connected networks of street and mobility solutions. Our approach presents an opportunity to consider connectivity to establish single family neighborhoods and the routes that people take to the stations. So then we decided uh, that we needed to look at some maps and see what's around these stations. We looked at like apartment buildings, um, shopping centers, opportunities for commercial and things such as that. And um, then we, uh, we had um, people come in and speak with us um, on different options that we could consider. Uh, we worked with the Land Development Code. Uh, we went to some of those presentations. And so we, we really tried to really take a look at it and just see what, what is out there, what can we do to maybe uh, add some mobility. So what we did is we looked at what exists today and uh, park and rides. We looked at parking issues. Uh, we looked at uh, bus transfer facilities for accessory ride and RTD buses, bus stops, bus routes, kiss and rides, uh, Uber lo loading zones like we have in front of um, the Old Town Station, and bicycles and pedestrian infrastructure. And what should be identified? What, what destinations should we be looking at that people could actually access any new mobility that we might come up with? Um, we looked at shuttles and uh, bike shares and scooters, dockless bike programs, RTD EcoPass and parking management programs and other. And with RTD um, EcoPasses, we really don't have any kind of a program in Arvada that has to do with EcoPass. Um, that people might have an EcoPass through their employer, but it's not anything that, that we have actually in Arvada that people can sign up for an EcoPass. Um, so we um, had some questions with all the people that came and talked to us. And I thought I'd read some of the questions so you can see where our minds were listening to all the different presentations. Uh, we asked about a circulator bus. What about door-to-door -door like Uber and Lyft? Would that help? Uh, what bus routes access the stations? Uh, how far are people generally willing to walk to a station? What, or transit for that matter, what is out there that might give people options to access the station? What already exists, what doesn't exist? Where would people live that might use uh, the new ways to get to the stations? How would Arvada manage new mobility options that don't exist today? Where would the new mobility options make the most sense? What about safety to those using new mobility options? Streets, sidewalks, arterials? Is that where we would put some of these new mobility options? How would we evaluate new mobility uh, programs to see if it actually works? Uh, what is the legal liability of a company providing a mobility option? Does it fall to them, the city, the individual? Um, who would monitor a new mobility option? Who to call if there was a problem? Uh, what would be the cost to implement a new mobility option to the city? And would there be any impact to neighborhoods? So we, we tried to think of everything that could possibly happen. And, um, and when we had presentations, we would ask these questions of the, the presenters. So after evaluating how does the TC want to prioritize the improvements and programs, we decided to develop a realistic strategy to recommend to the city council. Uh, also, staff presented an idea on how speed control, traffic calming, which is a problem throughout Arvada and some areas uh, on local streets, can be funded by micro-mobility while benefiting existing neighborhoods and increasing safety. The Transportation Committee discussed the idea and approved it to be pre presented to the City Council. Uh, the traffic calming program, it addresses uh, it addresses uh, speeding through traffic calming program created a safety measure for streets that have seen an increase in traffic volumes due to urbanization and growth. So uh, we continue to support 
uh, support quick and effective safety concepts that staff is piloting to crosswalks and expand it to bike lanes and corridors. So as an example right now, we're looking at the K-8 crosswalk and uh, also in front of the, uh, on Grandview, in front of the, um, the uh, Old Town Station because there's been some issues with traffic at those points and to make it safer for pedestrians. Um, we, uh, have, uh, we support a pilot project and, and we, we talked to uh, Bird, one of the scooter companies in, our, in Colorado and had a jillion questions for them. And we decided to support a pilot project to permit and manage 200 dockless e-bikes and scooters for all the Arvada stations, and that's including Ward Road as well. Uh, Colorado law, law allows scooters and e-bikes to be on uh, public streets, so it makes sense to use them for door-to-door -door mobility. And um, then what we would do is, if we uh, signed a contract with whichever group that we wanted to use, whether it be Bird or whatever the other ones are, uh, that money that we would generate from that would help to pay for some of the traffic calming programs that we would like to introduce uh, into some of the neighborhoods that have issues right now. So with that, um, we invite city staff to present information on traffic calming and how a pilot program would work. Uh, we had a lot of questions, um, and a lot of this is legal things that have to be worked out with the city attorney, and things like that of what we would do uh, if we did institute a program like this. But um, it's kind of a win-win situation because we would generate some money to do some traffic calming that we don't have now to do that. And also it might uh, give people an option to get to and from the stations without driving to the stations. And uh, as a side note, the other day I drove to all the stations on in Arvada. Uh, including the Ward Road, even though it's in Wheat Ridge. They were all full, pretty much, especially Ward Road. It was definitely full, and of course, Old Town, we know what that's like with the, the parking garage. I've been to the parking garage, and it's full. And, um, and there were a few places at Kipling Ridge, but um, anyway, it, people are using it, and so we're hoping that this will be a program that will get, give people an option of how to get to the stations. So with that, I don't know if you have any questions. Councilman Marriott. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I, I have a couple questions for you. So when you said you talked to Lyft and Bird about their scooter program, are you talking about them being allowed to, to implement that program out here and that it would generate actually generate money? Yes. And is that the reason they're not out here now, is we don't allow them? or Right. Really? I, we have to approve them okay. to come into our city. Okay. I always and assumed they weren't here because they didn't think a market existed because when they wanted to be in Denver, they just went in Denver. They didn't, they asked for forgiveness later. Well, yeah, they, they just, they just went there and started up, and yeah. Denver didn't know anything about it. But no, they would have to get permission. They'd have to sign a contract. Uh, all this legal stuff would have to be yeah. taken care of. Me, John, Maybe what, can that. Yeah. yeah, you want to expand on yeah, so um, it's not that the uh, devices are not here. From time to time, we might see around a, tra a transit station, like in the picture, sure. uh, one of Jump's bikes, you know, in Old Town, or a, a you know a bird's uh, scooter in, in the vicinity of one of the businesses. And um, Colorado law uh, this last year uh, allowed basically these devices on public roadways. So the, the companies can't be prohibited from using them in any of the jurisdictions. But Arvada doesn't have a permitting process to allow them to manage and, and operate within the city. So the idea is that we would catch up with that, just like Denver has, and begin to put some framework around where they should right. uh, have them, how they should park them, you know, some of the issues with responding to uh, a device that might have been left behind in, in poor shape. So we, we wanted to uh, make sure that talking to the uh, company that they do have that intention, and indeed, it's a business decision for them. So they would want to be able to come by and take care of their assets so they can make money for the company. Right. 
So are, are we lacking then here in Arvada? We need to look into that. Do we have any plans of doing so? Do we have is that in, on our radar? on that general concept from a legal perspective. Um, if you have any specific questions about the licensing scheme or anything like that that we might need to implement, Emily Grog is here and will be able to answer those questions. Yeah, well, not necessarily. I mean, I, uh, I've seen Denver and seen a presentation by the Denver folks about what they're doing and how they're doing it. I just, to me, it seems like ought to be something we get rolling on. <laughs> the, sooner, the sooner the better, if, especially if they're willing to, again, my assumption had always been that they didn't have any interest in coming and putting 60 scooters around Old Town because they didn't think there was a sufficient market for it. But uh, Yeah, um, the, the Transportation Committee is recommending that uh, we continue to go down that path with the yeah. framework around this. Um, part of the, the intention here is to wrap that into traffic calming because an environment where, you sure. know, we have just bike lanes the way they are and, and uh, pedestrian facilities the way they are, they're great in some uh, locations but not so in others. And so we want to make sure we kind of begin to establish that relationship between uh, a safe infrastructure where these devices and, and folks can operate. Right. Okay. So let me ask a couple other questions. So um, one of the things, that's the kind of the micro mobility. That's where somebody else owns the scooter and you lease it for your ride or rent it for your short period of time. What about, did you guys look into it all, um, other low powered electric or mobility devices? So I think, you know, things like could be a golf cart or it could be a electric bicycle, which of course, uh, you know, kind of like bicycles, but but there's even then a whole bunch of devices that fall in between those things. Did we do any look at those and and what what the future might hold for those, and more importantly, what what our regulatory climate might be? To, how how do we allow some of that stuff, or or do we not allow it? You know, how do we make that decision? Sure, the the model traffic code has some language for um, vehicles that can operate on the uh, public roadways. Uh, golf carts are allowed on streets up to a certain speed. I believe it's 35. And um, uh, with the scooters, recently they've d changed the definition from toys to transportation device. And that's where the laws are changing because these devices are emerging. And so tomorrow, if there is another device, you know, that emerges um, uh, and the laws begin to change to allow them, we would then consider them as part of any kind of emerging technology that would help with mobility. Mm -hmm. So do we have a, have a schedule of looking at that kind of stuff or a plan for how we would approach that? Because tell me if I'm wrong, but I, I think currently you, golf carts aren't allowed on our city streets. Uh, no, they, they are allowed up to a certain uh, they are speed allowed. limit. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, okay. And then um, let me ask one, one last question. I know we've talked about with first and last mile stuff before, um, you know, a circulator bus or something that helps get you between the transit stations or, or maybe even up and down Ralston Road, places that gets people the places they want to go. But it seems to me that, that in the last couple of years, the ride sharing companies have, have you know, done such a great job of kind of turning things on their head. Do they have the technology? Is there any way for them to do, you know, rather than us paying for and owning a circulator service and trying to operate a circulator service, it seems like if there was a, you know, extra dollar or two dollars per per ride in it for a Uber or Lyft dealer if they were a driver if they were within that one mile of the transit stations or something like that is there any uh, have we talked about that at all about a rather than going and owning a bunch of infrastructure and a program and all that 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 instead we we uh, partner with something that's already there and and uh, you know try to encourage them doing it for us I'll, I'll take this one <laughs> um, so I not specifically. We have looked at the concepts that are out there and how the service is provided and tried to decide and keep an open mind about what it is that we want to do. We think that these technologies, which, you know, as, as are evolving every year, uh, could be a solution for us. But we don't know specifically if Uber is going to provide its technology and service or Lyft or someone else. Um, in terms of how we would uh, charge, I think that's definitely something that we can look into because 
managing the curb is an important part of the equation, no matter what company or what technology we're talking about. And that's the part where uh, staff is interested in exploring that option to begin to allow private companies to operate and benefit, while the city and the public benefits as well. So it's a shared economy. All right. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Jones. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so uh, this is, thank you very much, first of all, for the work that the committee's done. This is a, 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 it's an important question, it's a challenging question, and one that I think we're gonna have to continue to, to work on, and it's going to evolve over time. And I appreciate uh, Councilmember Marriott and some of uh, his questions um, that have kind of provoked some other thoughts that I've had around this. But there is, um, there is actually a company, and I've drawn the blank on it, that provides kind of what you were talking about. You tell them how you want to connect this last mile, and they have um, a platform by which it can then hail a car or whatever, but there, it's through an app. And so there is, there is technology. I got to remember what the name of the company is. Is it Move It, possibly? It might be. Did you yeah. see them yeah. at CES? So I went and talked with them yes. while I was at CES. So last week I was at CES along with several of the other folks from the city, um, and it was it was pretty interesting. But um, a couple of things that I'd I'd like to see whether this is uh, well, it's probably going to be driven by the staff um, or by the but the, the team at Arvada is look at kind of that you know if you go back to the map that shows the radius around each transportation um, hub. And you know, you've got that half mile and that mile. And if you were to, you know, to draw straight lines from end to end and box it in and create you know, this innovation district. Um, so you've got this mile wide and then however long this is, but create this innovation district where um, we can write you know, a policy that says it can, be a, it can be any kind of mode of transportation and you can try all the different kinds of calming you know, traffic calming, but where we then begin to invite vendors to come in and bring their own bus or bring their own, you know, mobility van uh, to, to test it and see to where not only we're not we're not marrying ourselves to one idea or one company, but we're allowing people to come inside this innovation district and try their wares so that we can see one how it works. Um, we can try lots of different traffic calming procedures or activities. Um, and use this as kind of the, 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 the innovation spot or the, the, the testing bed for all of these things that could be possible um, throughout the city. Now, the reality is, is that, you know, that in that innovation district, that's probably where most of those last mile questions really need to be thought about anyway. Um, but there may be other technology that we can use inside of that um, innovation district that could then be deployed throughout the city, whether it's a different kind of lighting or traffic signals or, and again, I'm getting way in over my head as far as my technical <laughs> acumen, but it, it seems to me like that's something that, um, that we need to move on so that we can get some of these things moving sooner than later because, you know, there are a lot of cities that are ahead of us with this regard and there are probably some cities that are well behind us. But, um, you know, I think we have the, I think we have the right people to help us get there. And so that's what I would hope that our team at the city would take and the transporta transportation committee could begin to look at. And then from a legal perspective, how do we frame that and create that innovation district so that they can, it's just kind of, I'm gonna, Ms. Morris, you're not gonna like this phrase, but it's kind of a free for all, <laughs> um, in quotes, uh, to where we can just try lots of different things to get a better feel for what's possible. Um, so that's, as I was reading through the, the presentation uh, over the weekend, that's kind of the, the thought. Plus, I've just spent four days at CES. Um, so, uh, Mr. Fruzzi, do you feel like he was just in our Smart City Committee, but he was there with, <laughs> I think maybe he was listening in. I was not there. I'm no longer on the committee, unfortunately. But uh, would love to be a part of it. Um, so I, I guess that's all I have. But I really appreciate the work that the, the Transportation Committee has done because I think it's done, it's laid the groundwork for some of the thought that we need to have anyway. 
And so continue to, to, you know, to, to push the question and you know, ask why, you know, ask all of the why questions of you know, how do we get there. And so uh, just continue the great work and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. We, in our Smart City Committee, we use the exact words of Innovation District. That's why I'm like, were you listening in? I might have, I might have borrowed that from another city. <laughs> Fantastic. Go ahead. Well, I appreciate, you know, um, your thoughts and um, just, you know, we basically thought, let's give it six months. Let's give it a try. Let's see what happens. Uh, you know, we're not going to throw everything out there all at once, even though it sounds kind of interesting. I think you should. <laughs> it sounds pretty interesting. Um, but you might get a lot of calls. But anyway, um, this is a six-month pilot pro project that we're recommending, and we want to take a look at it and see if it works, and, and uh, maybe we can do some other things from the money that it might generate for that six months. And it's only 200 scooters and bikes. Uh, E-bikes, so. Thank you. Anyway. Council Member Ford. And Terry, would this six-month um, time frame be, include both the warmer months and the colder months? I think we're talking about, uh, and I'll let, let him talk too as well, uh, but I think we're talking about more in the springtime, but uh, by the time we got all the legal things done. but. Yeah, so, so we've been working on this issue for, I, mean, I think I've been here about six months now, so since I've been here we've been starting on the process of looking through the regulation and the permitting. Um, so ideally we want to do it in those warmer months when the most rides will be out there because that's how we can collect the most data and get the most use and see how things are working. It would probably, I mean just based on where we are now and by the time we would get set up, it would probably stretch into fall and maybe winter, but we definitely want to launch the pilot within a good, uh, good chunk of the warm weather months. Thank you. Does anybody have anything else on this? And the only thing I would um, throw in my risk management hat of how do we keep the bikes off the bike trails that are left behind? That's something as I ride my bike through down into Denver and see the line bikes left on the side of the bike paths and sometimes in the bike paths. That's always what worries me about these. I say let's bring in everything, allow people to get that get to that last mile or two but that's the hardest thing for me is who picks them up and how quickly can they be picked up when they're left behind yeah some of the things and since we are starting behind a lot of cities we've been looking at what everybody else has been doing how they're managing these devices and companies and through various ways of fees the, the risk of having a permit revoked we can kind of instill in those companies that if a bike is left somewhere inappropriately, you have an hour or two hours after it's reported, or the city's gonna take it, and then if you want it back, you have to pay for it to get it back out. So there's some financial ways to kind of motivate them to, to be good stewards um, and good partners in the city. So we're looking through all the options. That sounds fantastic. Well, if there's nothing else, thank you so much. Great presentation. Appreciate it. And up thank next, you. we've got the annual comprehensive plan implementation update 2019, Mr. Devin. Yes, Mr. Or I'm sorry, Madam Mayor and members of the council. We have um, uh, members of community and economic development team up here to present this information. Ryan Stachelski will lead off. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor and uh, members of city council. Thanks so much for having us. Uh, tonight uh, we are going to have a team presentation of our annual comprehensive plan update. Um, I'm gonna, will you go back to the beginning of the presentation, Allie? Thank you, just start at number one. Um, and so uh, who's going to be giving uh, this presentation is Patty McCarthy. She's our uh, long range planner. You uh, met her um, for the first time last week, but then we're going to go through and see where we are on uh, updating the implementation of the city's vision and several uh, members of our team are going to be uh, giving some of the highlights. So I'll, with any, um, no further ado, Ms. McCarthy. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Uh, 
The first comprehensive plan was adopted in 1964 and has been updated approximately every decade. The current comprehensive plan was adopted in October of 2014 and, and articulates the community's shared values and vision. In addition, these goals and policies of the comprehensive plan guide the development and investment decisions, and this plan is in, um, projected out for 20 years. The comprehensive plan update for tonight is the fifth one since 2014 and includes policies and implementation actions that are monitored to help measure the progress of the goals and policies of the plan. The comprehensive plan and the action matrix which gives you a more detailed review of these in the implementation of the goals and policies for the city is comprised of three chapters. The first one is growth and economic development. The second one is multimodal and transportation. And thirdly, the vibrant community and neighborhoods. There's a total of 153 policies for all of these topic chapters. The action matrix of the update identifies the policies, all 100, 153 of those for each chapter, identifies priority actions, designates the responsible lead city departments or agencies, creates a timeline for completeness of the implementation policies, and provides an assessment of the progress of these programs. On the far right column of the action matrix, it shows the progress of the implementation implementation actions of the plan with symbols that identify their status and high priority actions and programs are highlighted in red. The first chapter is growth and economic development. This is a quick overview of the policies and implementation actions in 2018. And for the update for 2019, of the 42 policies and 60 implementation actions, six of the actions were completed, 29 implementation actions are ongoing, 23 projects and programs are in progress, and two have not yet been initiated. The two that have not been initiated are exploring the benefits and process of the certified local government and prepared design guidelines for Stocky Walter and Alta Vista neighborhoods. The multimodal transportation, this is a snapshot of 2018 and their status, and in 2019, of the 33 policies and 36 implementation actions, six actions have been completed. 25 of these are ongoing. Four projects and programs are in progress and one has not yet been initiated. The not yet initiated project is the construction and opening of the Jefferson Parkway. And the third chapter is vibrant community and neighborhoods. And this is this overview in 2018 of those action items. And in 2019, of the 78 policies and 88 implementation actions, 10 actions have been completed, 61 are ongoing, and 17 projects or programs are currently in different stages of progress. And then I would like to turn it over to each of the department heads, or actually a representative from each department or agency to discuss the 2019 highlights. Good evening, uh, Daniel Riley with Arvada Economic Development Association. I just want to share some of the economic development policies and goal related highlights from 2019. First off is uh, regarding commercial development in our centers or our retail areas around the city of Arvada. And earlier this year we partnered with Long Range Planning to host a technical advisory panel with the Urban Land Institute which brought in a variety of private sector developers and finance professionals kind of help frame what the possibilities for the future of the Wadsworth corridor between I-70 and Grandview was. That was a very successful event which led to a report that was provided back to us that was actually helpful and influential in uh, the process we're going through with the land development code. Uh, next is development of uh, new commercial and em employment uh, real estate and this here is a great example of some primary employment that came to Arvada in 2019. This is Hestra's uh, new facility off of Ward Road. It's their North American uh, headquarters and uh, dis distribution operations, which relocated uh, from Golden to Arvada. And lastly, uh, this highlight is regarding existing business retention. As some of you know, 
uh, our existing businesses and our VAT are, are very valuable to us and we, we love them dearly. We want to invest in their health and vitality and growth here in our community. And uh, this is an example of a great success with uh, Front Range Excavating. It's a company we've been working with since 2015 who had outgrown their existing facilities in Arvada but wanted to stay a part of our community. And they were able to find some new real estate and develop a brand new facility uh, on the northwest side of town and actually overbuild that facility to house some additional commercial tenants. So we're very uh, excited about the fruition of that project. Um, so with that, unless there are any questions, I will turn it over to Urban Renewal. Yeah, thank you. Hello, I'm Carrie Briscoe with the Arvada Urban Renewal Authority. Um, the first project, and pretty much the theme for all of our projects, relates to creating housing diversity and transit-oriented development. So the first project, Gateway at Arvada Ridge, is in the Ralston Fields Urban Renewal Area. It's near Kipling and Lee Street, across from the RTDG line Arvada Ridge Station. This is the final phase of the Arvada Ridge and Arvada Marketplace development that includes the Super Target Retail Area. This project contributes 298 multifamily housing units, all three phases of this project upon completion later this year will have produced 680 housing units, 188,000 square feet of retail, and a private investment of approximately $176 million. This project is phase two of a transit-oriented development, development in Old Town, the former RTD Park and Ride Station. Um, it's in the Old Town Station urban renewal area adjacent to the Old Town Transit Hub. It's two phases to the project, including 252 housing units. This phase will include a 129-room hotel and roughly 15,000 square feet of retail. This project is currently in development review and expected to break ground in 2021. The former Safeway in the Ralston Fields Urban Renewal Area um, is now going to be the site of four cell townhomes near Ralston and Independence. Phase two of the Ralston Creek project that has already produced nearly 30,000 square feet of retail. This project will produce 45 four cell townhomes. Lastly, our micro housing project, which you guys have seen a sketch plan for, formerly called the Cottages at Ralston Creek in the Ralston Fields Urban Renewal Area. It's across from the Stanger Lutz Fields. Um, it's the site of the former Van Bibber drainage area. And we're hoping to accomplish 64 four cell micro units averaging 625 to 900 square feet. Thank you. Evening. I'm Ed Talbot, I'm with Housing Preservation and Resources, and I selected two projects I'd like to highlight for you in terms of the progress that's made, uh, being made on these. And the first one is the cooperative effort with uh, Cornerstone Associates to develop the Legacy Project. This is proposed as a 72-unit affordable housing project for seniors at uh, Sheridan and West 64th Avenue. We were not able to obtain 9% low-income housing tax credits for this project in a prior year, but as I think you well know, we were successful in getting the tax credit allocation for this project in 2019. So uh, Ms. Lucas, uh, Bobby, jo, Bobby Jo Lukes, who is the president for Cornerstone, is now in the process, based on the last report I received, of doing the construction drawings for the project to get them in and approved. Once she has those ready to go, she'll bid the project, select her general contractor, because she'll have solid numbers. And once she has solid numbers, she is going to come back and talk about uh, two other areas that we'll try to work with her to help basically finish or fill a funding gap in the project. One will be uh, a participation with the Arvada Housing Authority, and the second will be a funding proposal that where we can possibly bring a um, subordinated soft second loan to the project to fill a financing gap. So progress is being made, so we're hoping that we can see this uh, more happening here fairly soon on this one. The second one is- Mr. Talbot? Yes, uh, ma'am. Council Member Marriott has a question real quick. Yes, sir. Actually, Mr. Talbot, if you wanna go ahead and finish your presentation, I have a question for you when you're done. You bet. Second one is that, as you know, as uh, the Housing Authority was able to pick up about a 1.2 acre site at about Carr and uh, 52nd Avenue, uh, that was a piece of underutilized land the city didn't need. We've been working with Habitat for Humanity to bring a homeownership project to this site. 
Uh, we did have a pre-development meeting December 17th with Habitat to, with the city's development review team to iron out all the aspects of this project so they can bring it in for approval. So we're looking for that project to proceed and then to see uh, those propo that proposal come in so we can see progress on this project as well. And it sounds like I think there might be a question from Councilman Marion. Yeah, so the question I have, you know one of the goals of our uh, comprehensive plan is to disperse low income assisted housing throughout the city. Correct. Um, are we making any progress on that? I think that uh, indeed the uh, project at uh, 64th and Sheridan because it falls outside that southeast area is indeed I think one area where we're seeing a senior project, affordable senior project that would be outside that area of the southeast Arvada. And then we're also looking at, um, you know, there will be another project we've been talking about that would be in the southeast area, but would use some uh, underutilized land next to Old Town Arvada. But there's an advantage of that site being next to Old Town and also in close proximity for use by the residents in that project for the, um, for the light rail station. Right. And, and the, the, the other one you're showing here, the one down on Carr Street, that's in southeast Arvada too. That is correct. Okay, so anything outside of that? I mean, anything, Ward Road, Indiana, 72nd, I mean, anything outside of just all in the same spot? Mm -hmm. In terms of basically an assisted project that might you know be structured in a manner to utilize maybe federal subsidies or state subsidies and such to bring down the affordability and that project might be assisted for lower moderate income nothing solid that i would say is far farther to the north or to the uh, to the west okay thank you you bet good evening everyone my name is carice canales and i'm the neighborhood engagement coordinator I'd like to give two updates uh, related to neighborhood engagement and to public art. Uh, so the first one being that this past year, we were able to launch our first ever Neighbors Connected Leadership Academy. And so this program was really aimed at building capacity in our neighborhood leaders and giving them the skills that they had been asking for that would help them strengthen their neighboring efforts. So in this first cohort, we have about 20 participants, uh, and they are from all over the city, different neighborhood groups. Uh, actually, last week, Thursday, they had their second class where they learned about grant writing and how to tell their neighborhood story in a really compelling way to funders to, again, be more sustainable with their efforts. So they will have three more classes ending in June, so I look forward to updating you even further on all of those topics. Uh, the second update I'd like to give is that the Arvada Arts and Culture Commission is uh, under contract currently with an art conservation company called AMPA, and they are doing a full restoration on the dirt wall at the Arvada Center. So built in 1990, this piece hasn't undergone a uh, full-scale refurbishment, so this is really part of our commitment to promote and preserve public art in Arvada. Thank you. Good evening. Um, Gordon Rusink, Department of Vibrant Communities and Neighborhood. So the next four slides really uh, feature different aspects of the city's parks and recreation system. And Ali, if you could go to the next slide. It really focuses on the role that parks and recreation plays um, and focuses on our festivals and special events. In 2019, um, the City's Festivals Commission, a 25-member City Council-appointed commission, um, put on six events um, throughout the city. Uh, these events featured um, included over about 1,700 hours of volunteer time on behalf of the commission members and reached about 68,000 people throughout our community. In addition to this, um, the year brought with it a very heavy emphasis on um, working with our strategic partners, uh, most notably the Apex Park and Recreation District and our recreation partners in Northwest Arvada's metropolitan districts on how we could really activate the park system. Um, and that included everything from um, providing 40 different spots within our parks 
for those two uh, recreation providers to do outside recreation activities and programming, um, to working with Apex and the city's visitor center in landing our first international um, rugby tournament that will be held in this year. And then lastly, it really focused on how do we market and make it, um, our, our beautiful spaces available to a number of other groups. And so in 2019, we hosted 192 special events in the city's park system. There are weekends throughout 2019 where we had upwards to 10 special events occurring throughout the community, all in support of this effort to um, see the economic opportunity in making our spaces available. The next slide really talks about um, distributing these parks and recreation facilities. And over the last couple of years, we've seen a generation, um, a generational investment in the city's park and facility infrastructure in our community. Whether it's the city taking the lead with investments at Westwoods and Lake Arbor, um, or our partner Apex uh, with bond support of projects that represented the, com the community, or joint projects between us that resulted in the in Fitzmorris Recreation Center and it completing its first full year of operation. Um, we have positioned Arvada to really take care of replacing and keeping current. Um, all told, um, more than $70 million, um, including the new Myers Pool, will have been reinvested in our facilities and in the last couple of years. So a, a very remarkable achievement. The next um, area really focuses on what we're doing in terms of taking our trail system and making sure that we work in alignment with the pedestrian and bicycle system. And progress there was really made in two significant areas. One is we completed the um, hard and soft surface trail system um, represented by the Barbara Gulch Trail in the Candelas, excuse me, the Leiden Rock area. Uh, the other is we completed a very vital section of the Leiden Creek Trail west of Ward Road to Alkire Street. And then lastly, the focus is um, in addition to that on how we plan for our future growth. So in the last couple of years, we built 11 parks in Northwest Arvada to really match the growth that was happening there. In the future, that growth is really in Southwest Arvada. Um, and so what you see represented here are the planning efforts that have gone into building the new park that'll be part of the Sibels development, as well as the new parks and trail system as part of the new Haskins station. All of that is intended to um, provide expanded open space and, and a park system to meet the growing um, Arvada community. And in 2019, we were able to add an additional five acres of open space um, to our um, overall inventory. Are there any questions? Doesn't look like it, thank you. Hello, Mayor and Council. Brian Archer, Finance Director. So with any good plan, we've always got to figure out how to pay for it. So part of the goals that we'll cover tonight is ensuring that we're able to fund existing and future commitments. Council is very familiar with our 10-year financial plan. We also have a 10-year capital plan, which has enabled us to accomplish some very large projects. Throughout this presentation, many of my team members have made reference to them. But specifically, in this upcoming cycle, we've funded or getting ready to fund Ralston Road Phases 1 and 2, the 72nd Avenue underpass, improvements to pump stations, and the completion of the Parks Fleet Stores building. Here's a visual of the underpass. Secondly, we also have to revisit the financial tools and practices that we use. As you have seen earlier, we use Urban Renewal, TIF financing, Mr. Talbot made reference to federal dollars. We also have agreements, fee waivers, many other tools that are used to fund each of these areas. So far, we feel very comfortable with the tools that we have, but are always open to new and innovative ideas. Good evening, I'm John with the Public Works Department. Um, chapter three of the comp plan is the transportation tra uh, chapter and I'll be covering 
uh, a few of our um, uh, policies and, and projects uh, within that chapter, as, as it relates to that chapter. Um, one of the uh, projects, major projects that we completed in uh, 2019 is the uh, Indiana at 72nd Avenue intersection widening and signalization project. Uh, this eliminated a major uh, bottleneck on two major roadways within the, the city. Uh, another major signalization project that is ongoing is the Ralston and Petroleum Hill signal construction project. Um, we're reconstructing several of our signals. This is the first one to be implemented and the work is ongoing. Uh, one of the things that uh, we've been also focusing on in addition to our intersections and signalization is uh, our multimodal uh, transmission network and specifically trying to uh, b basically try to create a more comfortable, safer bicycling environment and walking environment for the most vulnerable uh, roadway users. Um, the uh, safety issue related to bicyclists and, and um, uh, cyclists is that they're disproportionately hurt and uh, injured during crashes compared to vehicles. So therefore, we've added a extra uh, a bit of attention to that. And with our resurfacing projects or any existing project, we are uh, trying to build in the buffers and um, uh, safety elements to make sure that we can add these comforts to, uh, to encourage people to walk and bike. In addition to our uh, bicycle en enhancements and uh, sidewalk enhancements, we also have been looking at our uh, crossing locations as well as our crosswalks themselves. Um, and we've developed uh, over the past couple of years a methodology for how we want to assess crosswalks, how we want to uh, uh, develop the signalization around crosswalks, where to place them, where not to place them, where they're most effective. Uh, we've been adding more uh, rectangular rapid flashing beacons, RRFBs. Uh, these are the push button systems where someone who is interested in activating it when crossing a signalized, uh, I'm sorry, a, uh, uh, a crosswalk, uh, it can basically act as a signal for uh, the crosswalk to slow motorists down and stop them for the, for the pedestrians to cross. And lastly, uh, one of the other things that is part of our uh, chapter three of the comp plan is traffic operations and safety improvements. Uh, as part of our effort, we have been looking at where to implement operational improvements by adding turn lanes. Uh, the example on the slide is from Car Street at West 68th Avenue, and um, the intersection has been restriped uh, to add a southbound left turn lane with the resurfacing project uh, that recently went through that area. And we saw an opportunity to also improve these uh, bicycle and pedestrian uh, uh, safety at that intersection too by adding a raised median. So we take these uh, uh, opportunities to implement the policies and the goals within the transportation portion of the comp plan uh, with every existing uh, capital improvement project that we have or developer project that comes to us. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Mayor Pro Tem and Council Members. I'm uh, Rick Osmus with uh, Information Technology. I'm going to give you a quick update on our uh, city's fiber master plan. As most of you know, um, in 2015, we had Neil Connect uh, look at all the city's assets, including the school district and the fire district, and to design a master fiber plan for the city, which is the map that you're looking at there now. The black lines represent about 55 miles of conduit for the master fiber plan. In late 2016, we started implementing that plan by co-locating with Comcast and other industry companies. In 2018, we did an RFP and contracted with Frontier Environmental Services to build out the rest of our master fiber plan. In 2019, we finalized an IGA agreement with both the school district and the fire district and then we also started pulling fiber into the existing conduit that we had in the ground. As of today, this is the map that shows you our progress. Those pink lines now represent 48 of the 55 miles of conduit in the ground, 
And of those 48 miles, 24 miles of conduit have fiber in it. The best news is that they estimated the fiber and the conduit to cost the city about $14 million. As of today, we have spent just at about $3 million, which uh, is a huge cost savings for the city. For 2020, we are excited to continue putting more fiber and conduit in the ground to finalize our master fiber plan. But we are most looking forward to uh, lighting the majority of the fiber that would connect the schools, the fire district, and the city facilities. And then that would also get us off the INET with Comcast. Thank you. You can change it to the Pfeiffer plan. Okay. Fiber plan, fiber, fiber. That sounds the same. <laughs> nice job. All right, I'm Jason O'Keefe with Utilities. I'm talking about the gross reservoir water uh, or gross reservoir expansion project. Um, we uh, signed a participation agreement in 1999 with Denver Water to um, be in, in that with them for 3,000 acre feet. Um, that's a, just under a billion gallons of water for us. So, and I think we're still on track for the 2025 completion date. Next would be the water conservation that we work on. So uh, we partnered up with Resource Central, um, working with them since 2013. And what we did is three landscape seminars, and what we got from those was two takeaways. One was that we needed one just for HOAs, and one that we needed to do turf removal. So um, turf removal is coming in 2020 as a pilot program with Resource Central and landscape seminars. We started last year, and we did one landscape seminar. Somewhat successful, but we hope to be better this year. So. Good evening, Ed Brady, Deputy Chief with the Police Department. Uh, the topics that I'll be covering tonight won't be new to you as uh, they're very similar to the topics that Chief Strait, Deputy Chief DeAndre, and I spoke with you about in November. Uh, so first is our Whisper Creek Community Station. As you know, this opened May 1st. Uh, we're very proud of it, and it just received its LEED Gold certification, which is another accomplishment for us. Uh, this year we transitioned to uh, niche RMS, and this was a big implementation for us. The last time we changed records management systems was back in 2002. So this was a multi-year process, uh, coordination between IT and our records department. Uh, in particular, Erica Gallegos and Carlos Volgamut uh, were very instrumental in implementing our new records management system. In 2019, we uh, had 11 departures, uh, two of those were retirements, and we had nine resignations. Uh, but with that, we were able to improve our staffing to 184 as of today. Our uh, complement is 187. So our marketing campaign with Built Blue has been very effective, and we've seen some great additions to our police department. Just recently, we received a co-responder grant. Uh, this grant was offered to five agencies. In Colorado, uh, the grant is worth 215000 the first year and 290000 for the subsequent four years. That will allow us to have four co-responders on staff, which is uh, after, it, it's the highest amount right behind Denver and Aurora. Uh, so that will really allow us to uh, do some work that we haven't been able to do in the past with co-responders just by having more people to follow up and reach out to people. Our fleet improvement. We had a city uh, process where, uh, ninja process, where we looked at process improvement. So in working with IT, our fleet, and the police department, we were able to reduce the amount of time it took for a vehicle uh, to get on site to implement it on the road from about three and a half weeks to uh, six days. So it was a, a success in getting more patrol cars out there. All of our additional vehicles have been put out with the exception of our uh, four new F-150s uh, that you will be seeing on the road probably in the next month or two. Uh, those just arrived on scene and our fleet is working on those now. Our core team, which is our community outreach resource and enforcement team was implemented in July to uh, work in the Old Town area. As you may recall, in 2013, we had almost 400 contacts with uh, individuals who were homeless. 
uh, and that has exceeded over 2,000 in 2018. So our core team has uh, been very instrumental in working in the Old Town area. And I should also note that the city just brought on a um, homeless navigator to also work with that uh, community. And then lastly, our uh, exploring further efforts to decentralize. So with our community stations, we've been able to put more units out into those stations. Uh, for instance, our traffic unit uh, is in every one of those community stations, uh, particularly staffed in Whisper Creek. Uh, we are also moving more detectives out to those to truly uh, move from a central strategy to our decentralized strategy, which we implemented years ago. Uh, thank you. So the, the last highlight um, I have tonight is uh, about the comprehensive plan itself. And as I was kind of sitting there listening to the presentation, the one thing that I wanted to uh, just kind of state uh, is how comprehensive this comprehensive plan is. A lot of people look at a comprehensive plan and they think that it's really a land use plan as it relates to development in the city. But you can see that the comprehensive plan has all different aspects of it that really take uh, to make quality of life. It's really a quality of life plan um, for the city and we call it a comprehensive plan, um, but it, it really does have so many things that bring the community together and, and make it great. And, and I really saw that in this presentation. Uh, the, the last part of the comprehensive plan uh, update that we wanted to bring to you tonight was really just talking about another piece of implementation and it is the development piece, which you guys are acutely aware that uh, uh, we have done, I think tonight will be the 14th workshop on the, the land development code and the modernization of the land development code is really one of the final stages of uh, uh, helping to uh, create the tools necessary to continue to uh, implement the, uh, the, land, or the comprehensive plan. So with that, I'll let uh, Patty McCarthy just uh, wrap up with a few closing remarks. So to continue success for the comprehensive plan, it's important to use the comprehensive plan on a daily basis, align the implementation actions with the CIP and other types of funding sources, and to continue collaboration and communications between the departments by continuing the comprehensive plan oversight committee comprised of department staff and agencies, and then that group also prepares and updates the action matrix updates for this comprehensive plan overview. In addition, provide annual updates to city council and propose proactive updates to comprehensive plan since this is a living document to reflect the current conditions of the city of Arvada. The next steps for the five-year review of the comprehensive plan is to continue using this plan as a powerful tool grounded in our community's vision for the future Recognize the changes since 2014, including the growth of our population to approximately 6,000 residents since 2014. Review the goals and policies. Update the goals and policies to align with the other approved plans. And to balance our citywide policy with neighborhoods' perspectives. What are the next steps? Continue coordination with council strategic results. Again, propose proactive amendments to comprehensive plan at early to mid-2020. Prepare sub-area plans in specific focus areas of the city to further implement the goals and policy of this plan it, during the year of 2020. And then to present the next update to City Council in December of this year. This concludes my report. Did you have any questions? Thank you. Anybody have any questions? Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. McCarthy. I thought uh, that was fantastic. I love hearing from every single department. And even though it's the 14th workshop, it gets better every single time. And we love hearing it because you guys do great work. Thank you. So before we move on to our next workshop, I just have to say thank you to Ms. Morris for this gorgeous gavel. And I feel like I haven't been able to bang it. So if you would just indulge me. Thank you. So. Next, we have remapping of the city in conjunction with the Land Development Code update. Mr. Devin. Yes, Madam Mayor and members of the council, uh, this item will be presented by Planning Manager Rob Smentano.
All right, thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, as Ryan mentioned, we've been here with you a few times about this topic over the years, and uh, we're hoping to kind of be near the end of this uh, process, and I'll talk about that a little bit more at the end of the presentation. But uh, to start off here, uh, you've seen this before, and we just wanted to reiterate the goals of this update, uh, of the Land Development Code update, and really to kind of focus on the last one here, which is the new maps associated with uh, the new zone districts. Uh, in terms of public participation, uh, again, you've seen this before, uh, but it has been updated a little more. Uh, we had an open house regarding the remapping uh, in December, and then this past week we had some open office hours, three days of last week, and uh, with that, we had about uh, uh, 40 to uh, about 90 new contacts or repeat contacts about this effort. So we thought that was a really good uh, response from the community. And for the most part, what we heard were, were positive comments uh, with a few uh, site-specific issues, uh, but uh, we think we've uh, compromised, made, uh, we're able to compromise on those and those will be reflected in the maps that you see as we move forward. Um, so the topics for tonight, we really wanna focus on the zoning map piece of this, but then also follow up on a few other items as we move forward towards adoption. So you did get the uh, zoning maps in your packet, and I know they were probably a little difficult to read at that size unless you opened them up on your computer and kind of zoomed in and out. Uh, so, as part of this uh, presentation, we tried to simplify some maps just to kind of give the overall flavor of uh, the remapping. So, the maps that you see in the presentation here kind of take all the residential categories and put them into one color, the, the yellow color. Uh, it takes all the commercial and puts it into the pink or red color the industrial zone districts into the purple color, and then kind of the tan color are the areas that would remain as PUDs, at least at this point in time. So with the northwest area, however, we will be taking a little more in-depth uh, look at uh, zone districts for that area, and there will be a workshop coming up on February 10th where that'll be discussed in more detail. Uh, so this map then, though, shows most of the, uh, the rest of the northwest area, and you can see in that area, a lot of what will remain will be PUDs. Uh, they had, all of those projects had fairly specific and unique development standards, and they didn't quite fit in into any of the new zone districts that we've uh, uh, developed. So uh, that will stay the case up there. However, as you look in more of the, the city here, in, in this instance, the northeast area, you'll see there are, are very few PUDs that will remain. We were able to uh, put most of the residential areas into one of our, uh, primarily the RN residential districts, but also uh, the darker brown there, which are the multifamily districts, either the R13 or the R24. And then the red areas, again, are commercial or mixed use areas. In the southwest area, again, uh, the far western side of the map, you can see there are still some PUDs that remain, but as you move farther east, uh, mostly we were able to uh, get development, the existing development into uh, the proposed zone districts, with the purple being the industrial uh, areas, again, red commercial and the yellow residential. And finally, the southeast area, uh, you can see this is where we have quite a bit of our commercial development, uh, and that is proposed to remain either in commercial districts or uh, in the mixed-use districts. We do have the Clear Creek area in the far southeast area of the city that will transition into uh, either the uh, light industrial or the general industrial zone districts, as well as some mixed-use districts. And so that's a quick overview of the maps. Uh, but if you've, as you zoomed, or as you looked at the maps you had in your packet, if you had any specific questions, we do actually have our GIS system pulled up here. So if there's any specific parcels that you wanted to talk about, 
we can zoom in on those. It makes it a little easier or a particular area of the city. Maybe this is a good time to take a little break and see if there are those questions that we can help out with on Council those. Member Marriott. The Kmart parcel. The Kmart parcel we are showing is mixed use urban. Um, let's see if we can get so that. So not here. PUD? No, not PUD. We, we were, hope, we're hoping to move the, all of that area generally into uh, the standard zone districts. And one piece of that, though, I'll talk about a little more detail, but I can kind of touch on here now, is in the mixed-use districts, we know there was concern about uh, residential projects in those districts. And so the way the, the uh, Land Development Code is proposed at this point in time, any residential project in an MXS, MXU, or MXT uh, uh, zoned area would require a conditional use permit which would require public hearings in front of the Planning Commission and City Council. The MXN, we were hoping to exempt from that because those are fairly small parcels and mixed use in terms of on a parcel by parcel basis is not as, as easy to do as the larger parcels in the other districts. Uh, so that's kind of where we are at this point on that proposal. Okay, thank and you. And so the, the Kmart, kind of yeah. circling back, the Kmart site is an MXU district, so uh, it would be a, uh, any residential project or any project that has a res residential component would require a conditional use permit. No, regardless of how, how, what the mix would be. That's correct. That's a proposal at this point. So every, every, everything and less, but if it gets redeveloped as purely commercial, it can be done as a use by it right would be essentially. Use by right. So any commercial or office type development, it would be the residential, any portion of it being residential, kicking it into a conditional right. use. Okay. Thank you. All right. I think that's we'll it. Anybody have any other questions? Well, actually, we'll, we'll you get have more slides. Oh, actually, I saw the question slide on my. Yeah, sorry. Uh, we need to. Uh, it's the yeah, there. You go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So just wanted to give you a real quick comparison as uh, to the current zone districts uh, and the breakdown and the proposed zone districts and breakdown of about uh, across the city. So I tried to put it in large chunks there, uh, the single family, duplex, multifamily, commercial, et cetera. And then below that are just the various zone districts that are involved in those segments of land area. Uh, with the current districts on the left side and the proposed districts on the right side. And you can see uh, we generally stayed about the same percentage of land use. Um, but what you can see is uh, the residential, uh, if you're looking at single family and duplex residential, uh, that percentage of land area went down. And that's because a lot of areas on the far uh, west side of town the open space component was considered part of that PUD and got the PUD zoning. What we're proposing to do here is break that out as a separate category. The open space category, which you see at the bottom, which you can see triples um, as part of the new uh, remapping. So that's where you see uh, this, the single family uh, reduction by about 11%, but that's because it's, that's that open space component. Uh, some of that other open space area also came out of some of the other PUD districts uh, that we currently have. But then, so you can see as a general rule, in terms of multifamily, uh, so that would be the new R13, R24, stays relatively the same as our current makeup of uh, percentage of land use. Uh, our strictly commercial districts stays about the same. Uh, the industrial districts, uh, that does drop down a little bit because we're proposing to, to put some areas that are on the fringes of those industrial districts into mixed-use districts. Uh, again, the mixed-use district, uh, you'll see that uh, that drops from 19% to 8%. And a lot of that is because the NC district, new communities districts, that we don't really use and have not used since they were implemented. But a lot of the areas that were zoned, 
uh, and C were open space areas. So that, a big chunk of that goes to the open space uh, percentage as well. And then the open space you see goes from about 13% up to 35% because of those changes. Uh, in terms of uh, comp plan amendments, which we just talked about briefly, uh, there are a few that we will be proposing as part of the remapping effort and will come concurrently with the, the LDC and remapping. Our areas where over time, over the last five years, we've, kind of, we've seen a change in requests for different land uses, uh, just very small areas of the city where uh, we really didn't pick up on the fine grain nature of uh, the land uses until we looked at the, the zone districts. Uh, we want to make those changes and propose those changes to you as part of this package. And this is just a broad overview of where some of those changes are. This is not meant to be comprehensive at this point, but we will get you a more detailed map as we move forward. But just to give you kind of a flavor of where some of those changes might be. And a lot of that has to do with the new mixed-use zone districts. As we touched on a little earlier, uh, in terms of residential uses in the mixed-use districts, uh, again, we would require conditional uses uh, for uh, any residential component except in the MXN. And we wanted to make sure you were good with a clarification about uh, kind of those uh, assisted living facilities, uh, nursing facilities, as, it, as opposed to independent senior housing projects. We did want to separate those out with assisted living and memory care being, facilities being considered commercial for this purpose. With independent uh, senior housing, those where they're independent have cars, you know, um, there's no care associated with it necessarily. Those types of uses would be considered residential and then would fall into that conditional use. Rob, can I ask you a question about that? So what's the ramifications of uh, assisted living memory care facilities being considered commercial versus residential and, and, and same with the independent se senior housing, vice versa? Is there a particular ramification for that or is it just more accurately describing the way they operate? Yeah, it's more actively describing the way they operate and the nature of them more so where the Typically, a corporation runs the memory care assisted living. It may be a nonprofit, but it's usually um, more of a commercial type facility in terms of the feel and the traffic volume, uh, where an independent senior housing project would have, you know, potentially additional vehicles, uh, less um, association with revenue as opposed to the assisted living or memory care. Right. And what about, I don't know if we have any here, but in places there are, um, Kind of senior living complexes that give that have a progression of of uh, things available from mm -hmm. ind independent people my age living there to uh, to to more intensive care situations, sure. uh, all kind of based in one complex or one one um, building mm -hmm. or one complex really not necessarily a building. How would those be? considered you know what would what would those be that would then if again if any element had a senior housing or just any type of residential that would then uh, require that particular project to go through a conditional use approval okay okay so Morningstar would be that example right correct because they have because they have a continuum a memory of care, care as yeah. well as right okay yeah just as trying to find out real life use case sure sure yep All right, and we just wanted to follow up again on a couple of parking issues, and we know this has kind of been a, a sticking point as we move forward. Uh, but this was, um, it was good to see the Legacy Senior Housing Project presented tonight because this is one of the examples that we used in terms of trying to calibrate a parking minimum for affordable units. And those will be projects that get, the way the code is written, the, the low-income housing tax credits. So that would be a project that is guaranteed to be a, an affordable project uh, for a certain length of time. And as you can see in December, this was kind of our breakdown. We were proposing studio and one bedrooms to be 1.25 spaces per unit, two bedrooms at one and a half spaces per unit. Uh, here are the couple of projects that we looked at. Legacy Senior, again, it was talked about earlier today, the senior housing project, and then Willow Green, which is off of uh, Sheridan, um, 
and their parking ratios. Uh, we looked at, based on our last council discussion, increasing the, uh, the parking ratio uh, so that studio and one bedrooms would be the 1.4 spaces per unit, which would match up with the proposed studio parking for any type of market rate project. And then two or more bedrooms being two spaces per unit, which would be 0.1 spaces less than we would require for a, a market rate project for a two bedroom. And that would then give you these parking ratios below, which you can see uh, would uh, increase the parking requirement for legacy senior housing by about 27 parking spaces and for Willow Green by about 17 parking spaces. So with that, we're hoping to, if, if uh, you, you uh, see this the same way we do, we would like to kind of look at recalibrating that and maybe dropping those just a little lower to match what projects have already been approved in the city uh, so that we can get to the ratio that seems to make sense uh, for community funding out there. With the one caveat that we do have some uh, language in the, the uh, LDC that talks about uh, getting site-specific parking studies, which could help us make that determination as well. Council Member Marion. So a couple questions about, about this one. So um, does the, uh, this section of the land development code, does it differentiate between senior and not senior? No, it just, uh, it just was really talking about um, low-income housing tax credit projects for okay. affordable housing. But our code previously has always differentiated between senior age-restricted and non-age-restricted. It did, although it was, a, a, it was a, not the best calculation. So uh, it was more related to any type of project. It could be a market rate or affordable, and it had, a, a, frankly, a really low parking requirement. It didn't make a lot right. of sense. So is, is, that, is that the staff's position that the previous parking ratio we required for age-restricted housing, whether it's subsidized or not, um, was not enough parking? Yes. But yet our parking ratio for uh, non-age-restricted um, housing, if its market rate was too much, yeah, we, so we're, we're trying to find that sweet spot. We still did differentiate between the two, but it's not as dramatic a change as uh, our current code. Right, and so now what we're going to say with this is that we're changing the ratio for market rate housing. We're lowering that a little bit, right? Yeah. But if it's affordable, we're going to lower it even some more? Uh, slightly, slightly more. Yeah, but that, that's kind but of But if the, it's the senior, proposal. then we're going to raise it. No, the senior, not, not raise it, but right. raise it from what it was. Not, not yes. From, right now, so we would it consider, was consider yeah. it the same, or close to, um, because under the code today, you can have one uh, for the senior housing. It was one parking space for every two units, so that's right. a big departure from what we've actually seen in terms of development proposals. Okay, uh, so, uh, so, are are you, are we sure that? So there's a couple of different issues there. Are we sure that the, the parking ratio, the new um, senior, so age-restricted housing, that we're not requiring too much parking for that, whether it's subsidized housing or whether it's market rate? Well, that we also looked at existing projects that have gone through the system, and we've calibrated that to match pretty okay. closely with what was, has been approved in the past. Okay, so we're happy with that, and there's no difference between or is there a difference between subsidized and not subsidized with regard to age-restricted housing parking? No, or we just have the age-restricted and then this, afford, this proposal right, for affordable. Right. Okay, so, so we're, we feel like we're okay on the age-restricted housing. So it's just the housing that's not age-restricted. We're requiring more parking if it's market rate and less parking if it's not market rate. Correct. And what's the, any, can you give us an idea, a percentage difference? Is it 10% difference? Is it 20% difference? Is it 5% difference? Just a, um, just a rough idea. I know it would, it could vary depending on their unit mix yeah, and all kinds yeah, of different things. Yeah, and that's things. kind of what it, I'm just trying to think through. I um, can certainly get back with you on that. I don't want to speculate okay. off the top of my head. I, I'm you know, just looking at the numbers here. But um, just to kind of give you a, a, the relationship, the next slide here talks about, we just wanted to kind of go back to the, the 
overall multifamily for uh, market rate projects. So you can see that parking count is really broken up into four segments. Right. Where for affordable, we're talking about just keeping it at two segments. That would at, bring at, that number. At these numbers or lower number? Than slightly those. number, slightly lower. So we were saying studio right. and one bedrooms would match the 1.4 right. for affordable. And and is that do we is that because we actually have data showing that people who live in subsidized housing have fewer cars, or is it based on what other people are doing, or how did how did we decide that 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 was the the right yeah. thing to do? Yeah. was to was to lower the parking requirement well again taking a look at kind of two pieces of that one projects that have been approved by the city through the through the public hearing process and here were just a couple of examples so we had those ideas in terms of what the market is requiring in terms of you know in order to get their financing even if it's a litech project they still have to provide enough parking for their 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 residents so this gave us a good idea of what that meant, both in the, the senior, legacy senior being more of an apartment project, where Willow Green is more of a townhome project. So we could kind of look at a couple of different cases there. And then just what we've been hearing from that community that does affordable housing and what they yeah. see as their parking but, needs. But they're always gonna want less, right? I mean, if, if you're developing housing and you can be cheaper to develop it, that's better for you if you're a developer. So, I mean, aren't you always gonna say, look, I want less. In fact, don't make me have any restriction at all. Let me pick, I'll, I'll pick something that's appropriate. Sure, I, but they do still have to get financing and it's still private financing. And just like a market rate project, the financial institution usually says, do you have enough parking to satisfy our needs from that financial standpoint that your project is not gonna be impacted? And so we've heard from them that it's, that's kind of where they are with being able to get financing. So uh, I'd say a lot of people would say get rid of parking standards altogether, but the reality is there's still yeah. requirements from well, a financial standpoint, and that's kind of where we've yeah. hopefully landed. And, and I would completely agree with you when it comes to commercial areas that the, the, the business or the property owner is going to be absolutely the best, the best arbiter or guide of how much parking they need you know a retail store or an office isn't going to locate where they don't have enough parking because they're just chasing their customers away or causing themselves problems so I would agree with that but I think housing is different because people are you know if a housing unit in a market like we have now every housing unit's going to be filled and and they'll just find a place to put their cars so it'll they'll, they'll impose them, them on someone else whether that be neighboring commercial property or neighboring residential property or something they're, if they're gonna exist, they need to have a place for them. And I think not having a place for them doesn't mean then they're not going to exist. I mean, they are going to exist. Um, so I, I guess if you could get back to me just on, you know, maybe even an example like uh, a, uh, if, if take that gateway project there at uh, uh, Arvada Ridge, if how many parking spaces it has and if it were developed under this code or under these standards as um, a market rate unit how many parking spaces would they be required and if it were developed as a as a affordable project how many spaces they would be required just so we could see a real world example of what the diff you know what it is what it would be under this, what it would be if it was subsidized versus not subsidized. And you might even, I don't want to give you more work to do, but oh, no, you might even do that for a couple, two or three of the more sure. recent projects we have just to more easily visualize what, what, what this looks like. For me, the, I, I'm completely okay with the philosophy of, of uh, age-restricted housing having a lower parking uh, requirement although maybe not as low as we just were because I think there's probably completely demonstrated logic for why that is I think you know at some age every one of us are gonna not have a car anymore um, but when we get to the non age restricted housing I I haven't seen anything yet that convinces me that um, because the people who are living there re receiving a subsidy on their housing that they have fewer vehicles. 
And so the logic of having different parking requirements for market rate housing versus subsidized housing doesn't it doesn't pass the test for me, um, unless there's some unless there's something I'm missing there. Um, I do understand why you might want it to be less because it encourages that type of development or or whatever. But the the consequences of that are that somebody's somebody's going to subsidize that by providing the parking for vehicles that are going to going to exist. So um, for me, that's still the part in my mind that's unsettled. If we're talking about a very small difference, then it, it probably doesn't matter. Um, and that's what maybe some examples of some current projects might give us is a, a, a better feel for how, what, what sure. magnitude are we talking about here in, in a real world application, not just, you know, this is kind of abstract. Yeah, well, so. maybe a good example, I'm just trying to go through it in my head. So the legacy senior housing project where it was approved with 92 spaces, if that was actually uh, a market rate project, um, going by memory here, uh, it would probably need, so we said uh, under this calc, uh, revised calculation, it would need 27 more spaces. Uh, it would probably be more like uh, 35 more spaces compared to what was approved if it was considered a market rate project. So it's about a 5% difference or something in that particular case. Uh, that would be more like a 30% difference. Well, I, don't, I don't think that's 30. If it, if from, it, it would be from 90 spaces to no, it's, 120 well, but it's, some odd. Uh, it's the 120 20s. some odd to, to 135. 135 odd. That's no, so, oh. Well, into, uh, I was kind of going off of what was approved. Yeah. The, so, okay. the, the difference is yeah. that mixing the senior part, I mean, you need to set the senior part away, part out of there. Yeah, yeah, mixing yeah. the senior in there, I think, makes it uh, confusing. Okay. It, it's more the non-age restricted, so non-senior, whether it's a... Okay. Uh, um, yeah, so Willow Green track Willow of Green all my is... names for it. Now the, the market rate housing versus not market rate housing take any, any two or three projects that are relatively new here and just give us how many, how many spaces are there, what would it be if it was built under the rules pertaining to market rate, and what would it be built if it were built pertaining to the rules but for, for subsidized housing if you did that. Well, sure. That would be the thing be, that I'd like to see, and I'd, I'd just like to know what the difference there is if it's you know, a couple of percent arguing about nothing it didn't make okay. any difference yeah so if willow, it is 30 percent that's staggering and that's a huge difference okay. and that's that that makes a difference yeah so willow green is probably that example it's it's a mark it's a, a, a affordable project but it's family oriented in their town home style. but that's already built right that's not if it were built to, or you'd say in if yeah it just to give just to give you a comparison okay. so under under the revised here they would require 120 spaces if it was just a market rate project it would be about 10 spaces more, so 130. Right. Okay, so that's an 8 or 9% difference then between the two. Yeah. Councilmember okay. Pfeiffer. Yeah, so I would also, if you're going to do this report for him, he had a column that says, what did we give an exception for? What conditions did we change? Because I'm sure in all those, we probably lowered the parking ratio. Mm -hmm. um, so it'd, it'd be interesting what was approved for the parking ratio. For the affordable projects? On the, whatever examples you give him. So if, okay. he, if he wants the one-off ridge, okay. yeah. it, I'm sh I think we lowered the parking requirements. That one because it was it's TOD it was, right there It was TOD the and it was right yeah. across the way, so we lowered the parking requirements. So right. if we're going to – what I appreciate with what you're doing is it's fact-based because it's based on what we've approved and all the variables we've approved based on all the conditions of everything that's come in front of us for the ratio. Mm -hmm. So taking that trend line – and then coming up with these numbers is, I think, is a good, a good way to see what the market is here for our town, um, okay. and what we've been approving. So, um, I think you should stay the course if that's the basis of how we came up to these numbers. And and I, I appreciate that you reached out into the industry, uh, and uh, the finance side to see uh, their feedback as well. So, I think that 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 works. Um, as far as as my opinion of these. Uh, you know, I think I think I'm good with where you landed, based on the way you got to there. Um, I, I, you know, I, I might differ my opinion than Mr. Marriott in. Not everyone has 2.3 cars in every house, and I don't think, 
these are the individuals that have the 2.3, 2.8, or whatever the number is for Arvadans. I'm not sure these are uh, some of the folks that would have two plus cars for a one bedroom uh, uh, apartment. Um, I, I think most of these would be located around transit, uh, you know, corridors and TOD areas that have access to transit. So the need for um, actual physical cars uh, would differ. So I do think it needs to be lower. Um, now, I would question one that would come up if it was nowhere around a bus line. Um, then, yeah, that would yield a different response for me. But I think what we've seen and what we've heard so far uh, have always been around some sort of bus line or major arterial road uh, to get access. So I'm good with where we've landed here. It'd be interesting data that, that, that Mr. Marriott's asking for. Um, just add that extra column in for me. That'd be great. Okay. Council Member Ford. So Rob, I'm a little confused when we talk about subsidized. Are we looking at income, uh, socioeconomic background for these, uh, for the residents who are living in these homes? So, um, you know, whether it's market rate or subsidized affordable housing, right? Um, are we basing that on what the banks are asking for? Are we basing that on what's actually being utilized in these complexes in terms of car usage? Well, it's, it's, just, it's based off of the projects that have been approved in the city, so we have a, generally a good idea about what those parking ratios were required to be and what the various councils over time have approved. So that's kind of the basis for that. But these are projects that are, uh, they would be only, this would only apply to projects that are, they receive low income housing tax credits. So that is, those are income restricted projects. And, and what's the basis for that? What's the uh, reasoning for that? Why we're lowering the number because they're receiving money? Well, it's generally because that, that group of people have fewer cars, generally, and that's kind of the consensus that's out there, and that's what we've seen in the projects that have, have gone through the system. So we know that for a fact. We've studied it, and we know they have less cars. Yes, we, based on this information, again, based on the projects that we've approved, we've, we're able to, some of those, like Legacy Senior, haven't been built yet, so that's kind of a, we have to see. But Willow, Willow Green has been built, and that's been around for 15 or 20 years, so we have a really good idea that they have not had a parking issue. Um, and we don't have a, a great deal of uh, truly affordable housing in the city, but those that we do have, we've not heard concerns about in terms of parking. Okay, thank you. Mr. Pfeiffer. I think you just answered my question. Have we ever gone back and looked at any parking conflicts? at some of these properties. We uh, haven't heard of any problems is what I heard you say, but have we ever right. gone back and just yeah. drove through Willow Green and see how it looks at 5.30 at night or six o'clock at night? Mm -hmm. and that is not one of them what we looked at, but we actually did that evaluation with Castlegate, I believe, which is up in the north okay. east part of the city. And um, we had that information, and my iPad's not working, but we did put that information in the Friday memo this okay. week. Um, but as a general rule, uh, that one, for example, has a parking ratio. It's a little higher than what we're talking about here, and that was, uh, it's an older project, but that one is a little over two spaces per unit. I did not read the memo. Okay. Yeah, and I'm sorry, I, I meant to bring it up here, and then don't, I can't okay. get the link to work. So. She's been picking um. on me, everyone else has been picking on me that I haven't read the memo. I'll get uh, to the memo tonight after this. <laughs> oh, here we go. I so, found it no. here. So <laughs> Castlegate. You don't, you don't have to look it up, Rob. I'm just kidding. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. So, that, so Castlegate, in terms of um, occupancy of parking spaces, uh, let's see, make sure I have the right row here because it's not green out exactly the way I'd hoped. Um, During the midday, um, the utilization was about 58%, uh, and uh, in the evening, um, mid-evening, which was 6.30 to 7.30, 
when we did this. And he, this was kind of, this was not a scientific, we weren't there every day looking at this, but the, the ratio did not change that much. It was about, so uh, during the day, I'm sorry, it was about 44% utilization. In the mid-evening, it was 50% utilization. So maybe the, the thought is, is, you know, obviously people don't work eight to five. <laughs> There's probably some people that work during the day, some people work at nights or swings yeah. or graveyards. So the, the parking demand Parking is, stays is pretty constant. Yeah, but yeah. it also is staggered, staggered because uh, supply and demand is constant probably throughout the whole yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. to compare to a uh, a market rate project, the utilization at, in the evening was much higher, anywhere from sixty to almost eighty percent. So it's a little and, bit and different. What kind of, I'm sorry, what kind of project was that? A, a market rate project. Market rate Those project. that we surveyed had a higher. Um, Parking space generate. occupancy rate at those hours we looked at. Thank you. I'll read my memo tonight when I get home, Rob. <laughs> Didn't mean to put you on the spot. No, it's okay. <laughs> I was getting jabbed up here. I know. <laughs> All right. So then uh, just kind of to summarize what we're doing with this land development code, this is kind of the, the big points we wanted to just make sure everybody was aware of in terms of uh, the changes to the LDC. We are tried to create the residential neighborhood district to bring all of our single family detached and duplex units into conformance. Uh, sometimes some of those out there we have non-conforming lots. The intent here was to bring everybody into conformity, but also to lower the, the height of residential structures, which we heard loud and clear through this effort, that the 35 feet was too tall for existing residential neighborhoods. So we've dropped the, the, uh, the height of buildings. We've created the mixed use zone districts with varying heights depending on where they are. Uh, we have reduced the number of zone districts significantly uh, across the board through the city. Uh, we've created an easier to understand height transition when you do have residential multifamily or commercial projects next to those residential neighborhoods uh, and made that easier to understand for folks and then the parking issues that we, we just talked about. Uh, so with that, the next steps are uh, to really, uh, the, the next steps are gonna be about that Northwest planning area. So there will be a council workshop on February 10th to talk about that area in terms of the, the remapping. We have scheduled that open house and it will be February 18th. We'll get you that more information on that, but it will be in the Candelas neighborhood. Uh, up in that area. Uh, then we will kind of go through the, the uh, second draft of the map and we don't foresee many changes, just a couple little ones here and there based on our conversations over the past week or so. Uh, we'll have a new land development code and draft map for you to review on February 3rd. And we'll have a little bit of time there for the, the community to comment on that. Planning Commission public hearing on uh, the bulk of uh, the, the uh, effort will be on March 3rd. And again, that'll be comprehensive plan amendment, land development code text, and remapping. And then it will come to you for a public hearing on that piece on April 6th. With the Northwest Arvada remapping, we're looking at a Planning Commission hearing on March 17th. And then that piece coming to Council on April 20th. And as always, we have all of this information on our website, advancearvada.org. And that any concludes my presentation. Any more questions? Fantastic. Great job. Thank you. Thanks. It looks like that's our last workshop. Mr. Devin, do we have any updates from our team? Uh, no updates, Madam Mayor, members of the council. Uh, just a reminder that uh, next Monday's a holiday, so obviously we don't have a council meeting. Our, our next uh, council meeting will be on January the 27th. Uh, it'll be a business meeting. We do have a presentation on the Foothills Animal Shelter that evening. Uh, I'm sorry, that, yeah, that evening. So that agenda will be getting out to you within the next week here. Great. Anything? Ms. Morris? Not from me, Your Honor. Thank you again for this. And anything from us up here, council? Anything? Great. We are adjourned.